Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Chess Steps, this series where I play against my very own subscribers and I go up the rating ladder in 5 minute and 5 second bonus games. Episode 3 is called what it's called because, yes, we did actually win a game in 4 moves. There is a timestamp on the video player to it if you just want to jump ahead. The major difference in the feedback that I've received from the first two episodes is number one, why is this different than your How to Win at Chess series, which is almost the same thing. Well, the difference in that series is that I'm always trying to play the best move. I'm just trying to optimize the game and try to give you all the best kind of moves at, the, at, at that moment. But in this series, I'm trying to play at the level of my opponent as I go up. So at times, I'm letting them get away with things. I'm also letting them uh, hit me with certain tactics, and hopefully I'm going to lose a game at some point. Um, and uh, the other bit of feedback that I've received is... Um, it's, it's a bit more of a freestyle learning, and you would appreciate if I kind of threw uh, concepts like that we're going to try to follow throughout the episode. I know some, some folks do it like that. I have my own unique style of, of all this, so um, other than that, the, you know, the feedback has been pretty positive. It's very difficult to compartmentalize just concepts into every single episode, so we are going to try to build on chest steps 1 and 2 today against 1,000 to 1,400. Uh, D4. We're also not going to be playing any unsound gambits, although we can, but uh, that's that, that's more how to win at chess style. So um, I'm going to play uh, D4, D5. Okay, well, this is not the, the first time uh, that we've played against the London, but today we are going to play the optimal way against the London system. This is a very good anti-London, especially if they play D4, Bishop F4. If they play D4, D5, Knight F3 and Bishop F4, you can play uh, still Knight F6 and C5. But I'm going to show you immediately this move c5. Uh, and, and in general, against the, the queen's pawn, I've already mentioned this in previous episodes, the c-pawn is your best friend. So the reason the c-pawn is your best friend is that when the knight goes behind the c-pawn, you actually have genuine pressure on the center. Whereas if you put your knight in front of your c-pawn, which is kind of what we did in chess steps one, um, then... Uh, then you don't actually have genuine pressure on the center. Your knight drives directly into a pawn. So... Uh, as you move up the ladder, you need to have certain responses ready against certain openings. So, for example, you can't just freestyle against the London. Uh, you actually have to put them under a little bit of pressure. So what I'm going to do uh, is I'm going to play Pawn Takes Pawn. And this is a little bit more rare. Uh, besides the knight coming out with the C-Pawn, you also have the queen coming to B6. Uh, my idea here is because I haven't moved my knight to F6 yet, this is very, very important, uh, there is another way to play against the London, that is a little risky, a little bit risky, but it's actually very strong. And that way is the move pawn to f6. The move f6 uh, intends to expand on the king side into the bishop and the knight. Why is it a little bit dangerous? Because you're obviously weakening your king and you're breaking normal protocol with the move knight to f6, like you're supposed to be putting uh, your knight here. But believe it or not, this way of playing against the London is very annoying. So playing f6 and either for g5, h5, uh, or for the center break, e5, which right now you can't achieve because white obviously controls it. But if you pin the knight to the queen, um, then you can play the move e5 successfully. So right now, bishop g4 and e5 are both possible, uh, me meaning, sorry, that plan is possible, but also the expansion on the king side. Uh, I'm going to play the expansion on the king side. Uh, because that's sort of my point. And I'm going to just show you how, how annoying this really can be for, for an unprepared London player that just wants to play their bishop out to f4. Again, it's a risk, but it, it, it could be a risk worth, worth taking because in, admittedly, it's a very annoying way to play uh, when you're met with this kind of spiky structure. Uh, bishop b3 is actually not a bad move. So now, now here's the thing. You have these pawns, right? So if you move this up, you're going to lose this pawn, right? So where are we going to put our pieces? Well, if you move g4, that move actually doesn't look that bad. It looks like it follows our strategy. Uh, and I'm going to play it. I don't necessarily think it's the best move. Uh, and uh, the reason is because when the knight comes here, I, I, don't, I don't have that much. I, okay, my pawn is on g4, but I've sacrificed basic development for a little bit of space, right? And I'm a little bit lucky that the queen is, is kind of guarding this, right? Uh, sorry, that, that the bishop is guarding this from, from the enemy queen. Um, but this this really does look like a 1,000 rated game. Why does it look like that? Well, it looks like Black watched a new video, right, of mine or somebody's and wants a, a London weapon. And here they have this very strange position. So uh, now what? Well, we can develop in a bit of a strange way. But remember, we, we did talk about 
playing in the center as well. So now that the move e5 is possible, which is the other kind of idea of putting that out there, uh, and now the bishop doesn't really, doesn't really fight against any of our pawns, I am going to go for this move e5. It's a very strange position, and it definitely comes with certain risks. Uh, the risks being that our king is open. I've already talked about that. The king is a bit open on the light squares, but we're doing a pretty good job boxing everything in. Let's also not forget that we are threatening some stuff in the center of the board. Uh, but 1,000 games can be extremely, extremely chaotic, right? So uh, bishop, uh, bishop b5 pins the knight to the king. And now I can imagine there being many, many moves played. Uh, my, my general rule of thumb is we can either continue to develop uh, or we can attack this bishop. If we take in the center, then after bishop takes, we can't actually take that because we're still pinned. So I think a very natural move here would be just asking this, like, what is it doing, right? So if the bishop takes the knight, we take. Okay, this is still equal. This is still equal. Okay, now, now this, this is really, uh, this is really where 1000s can get lost. Um, and, uh, and, and the reason is there's so much tension in the center here. Uh, and there's bishops, knights. I mean, we, we still have to get out and, and develop. If we trade too much, then we're going to open up the board. Um, I'm going to take this pawn. I feel like it's kind of a natural reaction. Of course, developing is also okay. We're going to take, take. That seems like a fair trade. And now, and by the way, these are, like I'm saying, these are not necessarily all the best moves. I'm playing moves that are safe and sound. Um, now, what I'm looking at is, okay... If I just keep all my pieces on the back rank, this is move 12. This is probably bad. So what I need to do is speed up my development. The best way to speed up your development uh, is, um, is with tempo. So if you can make moves that actually attack the opponent's pieces, that's good. And the opponent should probably not move those pieces. The opponent should try to improve their position if the trade is fair. So rook c1, very reasonable move. Queen a4, yes, also a pretty reasonable move. And an attack on my pawn. So I've sort of fallen behind here in development and um, it's, you know, it's causing me to, uh, it's causing me to suffer. Like, what, what am I going to do? And, and, and this is under attack. Oh man. Okay. So uh, I'm going to play rook c8, which is, um, it, this is hanging, but so is this. So this, this game is, is, is super, super chaotic, right? And it's an example of, you're trying to refute an opening with aggressive play that doesn't always work uh, at, at the lower levels, right? Uh, but can lead to total chaos. Castles, okay. So my opponent misses pawn takes, and, and I guess this. Um, I got to get my pieces out, right? So, so let, me play, uh, let me play pawn takes d4, uh, because I see that that's a free pawn and the bishop's under attack. Now, this is an extremely dangerous position for black, like... Because again, I, I need a few more moves to get developed. My opponent should move out of the way. Good. And now uh, attack me uh, on, uh, on the E file. I'm thinking I need two more moves to get settled, right? So what about bishop C5? So, uh, I mean, I could have gone to E7, but I think I want that square for my knight. Rook E1 is a menacing move. Because against Rook E1, I'm going to have to protect my, my, my bishop. And most likely, I'm going to have to protect it with my king or my queen. And both of those things seem... Very unpleasant. Okay, incorrect, because that's not, that, that's not actually putting genuine pressure on my position. So now I'm going to play knight to e7. I am just a move or two away from consolidating and being out of problems. Opponent needs to be attacking stuff, creating threats. That move comes too late. That move comes too late. And I might have rook a8 here, by the way, trying to... I, I think rook a8, by the way, immediately going for the queen attack, right? But my plan was to castle. I'm not trying to play every best move. I'm trying to castle, get to safety. Okay, now my position is beginning to make a little bit more sense. Um, and uh, rookie one finally arrives. Uh, my bishop is under attack. I can protect it. I can move it. I'm not trading. I'm not trading because... There's no, you know, Gotham told me in a video I don't need to trade bishop for knight unless there's a very good reason. Not to mention that that comes with checks, so don't just auto-snap. Uh, I'm going to move my bishop to safety. I don't think it's the best move, but the bishop is kind of safe. This knight is kind of protecting the infiltration square of the enemy knight. 
I don't know. It's a, it's a tense position. Very, very tense position right now. Rook A8 is still possible. And now that, that, that move is what you should be thinking about because you should be thinking of maximum danger. How can I put my opponent under maximum danger? The move Rook to A8 comes at a moment where the Queen's just got nowhere to go and my opponent forgets, right? They forget, right? And now they might blunder again. They might blunder again. Usually one blunder follows another blunder, but right now Rook C1, okay, B4. It's actually a pretty good move. Uh, I'm gonna go, oh man, where do I move my bishop? Um, okay, let's go bishop d6. Uh, Gotham said to trade pieces when I'm, uh, when I'm up, but I'm forgetting the knight. The knight is being hit twice and my bishop was protecting my knight. Oh no, who's gonna take my knight now? Is it gonna be the queen or the rook? Right, queen trade maybe if, if we get that on the board. I still have a very strong pawn here. I don't know. Rook takes is definitely the best move. I just want you to know. Rook takes to combine the queen and the rook, right? So if the rook were to arrive, then we need to worry about getting checkmated, right? Right? So... Now, my opponents also... There's an element in this series that you might get nervous because you're just not... You're like, why the hell is Gotham just losing against me? But that's the point. That's why I'm having fun. Uh, rook takes, uh, okay, opponent completely misses it, completely misses that my knight is hanging, oh my gosh, what is the point, you want to attack my pawn, right, um, so now obviously I'm thinking about harassing the queen, I'm thinking about rook takes pawn, I also am like, oh, my opponent wants my pawn, what if I push it, a lot of us, we, we forget about continuity, like we can just push the pawn, it doesn't necessarily have to stay on that square, right, the, 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 the nature of, uh, of pieces just stagnating, right? And by the way, this knight has been trapped the entire game. The knight just can't make it back into the game, but it's a very common mistake for players. Continuity, you used to control that square. I'm gonna play here thinking I'm gonna trade, but boom, the knight is gonna jump in. Rook c4, okay, that attacks my bishop in the pawn. Tunnel vision though tells me I wanna promote, so let me play bishop to b3 so that I wanna go pawn push, but I'm forgetting it was a fork and my king would get hit, but white might forget that the check comes and you don't actually have to protect the rook, right? But if you sidestep with the rook, I'm going to push, push. Rook d2, you see? See what I'm saying? Now there's this, I'm like, hmm. What if I go here and here? That's back rank. Oh, yes, that looks really good. I'm going to take this and, and okay, check. I'm like, hmm. Move to safety. And now I see back rank. Now that that rook went up and my opponent thinks that this move escapes mate but it doesn't rook d1 comes i mean rook a1 and now i'm gonna take always remember when you make a fort and a getaway square for your king it has to not be covered by the enemy long diagonal piece and ladies and gentlemen that is how a 1000 rated game tends to go that right there that what you just saw is a pure 1000 rated game now a couple of things right off the bat um while I do think that c5 in general is the way to play uh, against, the, against the London system, as you saw in this game, this f6 system, while it can be very, very double-edged and annoying, it's not for the faint of heart. Um, it's, uh, it's not a bad way to play. The problem is that here, even though, uh, it, even though after all of this, th this is actually the best way to play. Like the, the computer thinks that, you know, playing like this or, for example, um, playing something like... Uh, g5 and then and then knight h6 very unorthodox development of the knight to try to play knight f5 and take the bishop and then finish your development uh with something that looks maybe like this take take bishop g7 castles and then e5 in the future um this like is okay but uh it, it's risky and the, truthfully the absolutely optimal way to be playing against the london is to put a knight on f6 then c5 and then play with queen on b6 to go down to b2. And that, that, that might look something like this. Get your light squared bishop out and then try to expand on the queen side with, uh, or taking in the center and playing on the queen side. This is the best way according to top level theory. Uh, this is if you're looking for some sort of swashbuckling action. And um, yeah, I mean, this is the risk is that if you don't flip the switch and go, wait a minute, uh, I'm actually not doing so well here. Like this position is equal, but it's extremely dangerous because you just have all your pieces on the back rank. And I, and I actually didn't, I didn't play the best. And at this point, I, I actually think it's, it's plus five. <laughs> it's plus five for white if my opponent had played rookie one. 
And the point is that, like, for example, if I'm just going to defend like this, believe it or not, because I'm so far behind in development, my opponent actually can just sacrifice. So there's these ludicrous moves that bait the king out into the open, like, come to me. And for example, queen b3, and there's just, I mean, it's just not easy. It's just not easy to, to protect my king, right? Even rook e1 in the future. Um, but because my opponent played rook d1 and queen a6, now they're lost. They go from plus 5 to minus 4. This is a 9-point swing, because here I could have played rook a8, queen b7, and bishop takes c4. And I'm up a piece. I'm just, I mean, I'm, I'm up a knight, and that's actually what ended up happening, because I, I changed the, the gear completely to castle. Right, now the queen got stuck, and like I said, maximum danger, you always have to be thinking about that. Right here was the critical moment. Opponent absolutely had to take advantage of my king being stuck in the center. But that's life. You live and you learn. Uh, if you'd like a little bit more solid way to play against... Uh, the London, then, well, there's many ways like that, but F6, G5 is, uh, is a pretty interesting and, and exotic one. Uh, for this next game, I'm actually going to jump uh, to play against the highest rated player, believe it or not. So, uh, and um, against the highest rated player, because they have to go. Against the highest rated player, we're actually going to play some theory. So I'm going to play E4, uh, and my opponent plays E5. So... There are many, many good ways to play against e4, e5. There's various gambits. Uh, I'm going to play knight to c3. So I'm going to be playing actually what I recommend in my, uh, my, my e4 course, uh, which is the Vienna. And my opponent plays a very interesting move. This is called the Zhuravlyov counter gambit. And they immediately put pressure on my knight. So there's a couple of things that you can do here. You can play f4, uh, which is... Uh, which is kind of the Vienna Gambit style. And normally the Vienna is either at knight f6, f4, which is the Vienna Gambit, or knight c6 with bishop c4, uh, and et cetera, et cetera. But if you, let's say you're like 1400, you've just got my Gotham e4 course, or whatever, wherever you get your courses or watch YouTube videos, and you see a new move. Like, what the hell is that? Well, I know my plans in the opening are either to play f4 in Gambit style, uh, queen g4 to attack g7 is a common idea, um, okay, yeah, let's, uh, let's go queen g4. So queen g4 attacks the g7 pawn, and I'm just gonna very quickly show you all. Why do I know about queen g4? Well, I know about queen g4 because in one of the Vienna things that I studied, right, queen g4 is a move to attack the g7 pawn in the copycat variation. So because my opponent played bishop out, I'm gonna go for queen g4. Do I know it's right? No, I'm 1400. I have no idea if it's right or not. Ah, now, after queen f6... We have knight to d5. We know about knight to d5 because uh, we know that the knight in a move ago actually could have gone there. And, and it's, it's very natural to react with the move knight to d5, but I'm like, well, the bishop's just going to move back, right? Now there's a major difference, and I actually think that black just lost the game. I think that because the queen has to guard g7 and b4, I think black is just straight up losing. I think my opponent blundered on move four. I would almost want to give them a rematch, actually, because I feel like this is a little bit too short for the series. Um, I'm gonna ask if they want a uh, if they want a rematch. But but that that that's that's the advantage of learning these these openings as you get to thirteen, fourteen hundred. Um, and it's actually just devastating here because if you move the queen, I'm gonna take the bishop. And then I'm going to take on g7. Um, so I, I, I don't know. Yeah, so my, I mean, my opponent's just going to, I guess, give me a piece. Uh, I'm going to ask my opponent if they want to redo. I know you're not supposed to. Yeah, I asked. I think we're going to do it. Okay. For the integrity of the series, we will do it. I just told my opponent not to play queen f6. All right, so we're going to do e4, e5. But there you go. That's how you win in four moves. <laughs> That's how you win in four moves. Bishop b4, and I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm offering my opponent the opportunity uh, to just not play queen f6. So maybe g6. But again, folks, that's... that's Welcome to the big leagues. The, the venom in these openings is unbelievable. The Vienna is one of my favorite openings. In Blitz, uh, I don't play it in Classical because uh, it's, it's equal for Black. And it's not played at Grandmaster Super GM level because it's equal. Like, 
the whole point of openings at the meta level is to equalize. You want an equal, equalize, like a position where you want to pose problems to your opponent at a microscopic level, maybe with white. Um, and, uh, and with black, you're trying to equalize. So the super GMs, they know how to equalize. But below a certain level, I mean, nobody knows how to equalize. And chess is supposed to be fun. You're supposed to learn. I mean, so bishop takes c3, right? Now I'm starting to think about queen takes g7 anyway. I mean, I'm thinking, do I just take back? Can I just take on g7 regardless? I don't know, because this bishop still kind of... I'm going to say, oh, you know what? I'm, I'm going to try to be a little bit fancy. What if I play queen takes g7 anyway? Right? Okay, bishop takes d2 check. Nice move. That is a very, very nice move. Great move. Uh, it's important you don't just play queen f6 here, because I'm going to trade and then win your bishop and keep my pawns together. Bishop takes... Uh, Bishop takes e2 is an excellent move because it's called a desperado. So my opponent's going to lose the bishop anyway. So what they do, they sack it with check. Now I take and now they're going to play queen f6. So they're going to avoid significant material loss. Great. That is a much better version than what my opponent just got, right? Um, do I trade queens or do I go all the way back? I'm 1400. I feel like, you know what? Queen trade is, uh, is fine. Queen g3 is a waste of time. I want a long castle, but first, obviously, I have to deal with this. And since I want a long castle, uh, the move f3 is actually not so stupid. Now, on the other hand, you can put your bishop here, but it's passive. And what I mean by that is 1400s think more long term. They think, yes, I'm temporarily solving this problem, but my bishop is what, going to stay there forever? No, I mean, I want my bishop out in the open, right? So let's long castle. Okay, great. I have seven pawns, opponent has seven pawns, I have two bishops, they have two knights. Um, we both have seven pawns, which means that the position is relatively closed. And in positions like this, you do, you, you're looking at pawn breaks, but you're looking at pawn breaks that don't create massive weaknesses, which is you know, something like e4 is a bit of a massive weakness. You also would like pawn flexibility, and what I mean by that is if you play a move like c4, you have a gaping hole on d4. So... You want to maintain maximum flexibility. With that, I'm going to put my knight on e2 and figure out where it's going. Is it going this way? Is it going this way? Bishop e6. Is that under attack? No. Actually, believe it or not, no. Because I can trap the bishop. But I don't know that. I'm 1400. I'm going to play king b1. Because you long castle, you might as well play king b1, right? Okay. Right? Might as well. So... Now, where are my opponent's pawn breaks in a position of seven pawns? I just made a video on close positions. D5. Uh, decent pawn break, right? Could be something. Okay, h6 is kind of... You know h6 actually is, is uh, potentially brilliant because um, maximum danger tells us we have to look at attacks on the pieces, right? And I think my opponent wanted to go long castle. But my opponent saw the move bishop g5. Right? So they saw bishop g5, which would have pinned the knight to the rook, and they played h6. That's a great move. I thought it was actually silly at first, but I'm like, ah, I see what your point is. I was like, I don't know, what? That's funny. Um, what do I do? <laughs> Position's completely equal. Like, I mean, just simply completely equal. I want to develop my bishop, right? Mm, so, where am I going to move my knight? Am I going to go to c3? Am I going to go to g3? Can I take some space and then put my knight behind it? Very committal. Right, I'm very, I'm very committal if I do that. Uh, let's put the knight on... I'm trying to think like a 1400. Let's just put the knight on g3. I don't know. I want to move my bishop out. Maybe bishop here and bishop here to double the pawns. Doesn't seem like a stupid idea, right? That's the only reason you would trade bishop for knight. Um, and also knight f5 is actually a pretty reasonable move. So I'm gonna, you know what? I'm going to play this. I don't necessarily think it's best, but I see that because my opponent gave me a weakness... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go and attack it, right? My chest is relatively simple. Okay, and now I'm going to say I have two bishops, so I'm better. Am I better? Mm, I don't know. I actually don't know if I'm better because I've doubled my own pawns. Uh, and when, I, when I've done that, exactly. That's actually a great, you know, my opponent's immediately going for it. If I go and protect it, I lose this pawn because... So I, I at this point, even though earlier this move I didn't really want to play because it was going to be kind of passive... I have to. I have no other choice. Danger levels doesn't apply. I can't do anything. So bishop to d3. The other thing that I've done by doubling my pawns and giving myself this kind of annoying weakness uh, is I've surrendered the center. My opponent can very confidently put e and d together. Oh, no. No, no, no. Miracle blundered again. Because bishop g5. The pawn was there to prevent the move bishop g5. 
and immediately blunders. But you know what? I'm 1400. I'm going to kick the knight out of the center. I'm giving so many chances against Mirko. But yeah, bishop g5 just is huge. It wins material because the knight is not guardable. Um, yeah. Okay, I want to go g4, so I'm going to play rook g1. Bishop g5 wins on the spot. Black would have to move the knight, sacrificing the rook for my bishop. Uh, but again, I want to I want to expand with my pawns here. I, I miss bishop g5 completely because uh, in my mind it was impossible, and that happens all the time. That happens. You just you're just like, oh, I can't go bishop g5. I just can't do it. Now bishop g5 actually is really funny. Bishop g5 now there is rook d6, which did not exist a move ago. So d5 actually made way for that. Uh, but I'm gonna I'm I'm thinking about g4 here, right? So my plan is to go g4. I'm gonna do it, and it's a blunder. I've blundered. How? How did I blunder? Well, when the pawn takes, there is this. I've completely forgotten about the fact that when I moved my rook over to push my g-pawn, I didn't visualize that at the end I would be losing h2. However, oh my gosh, this is crazy. <laughs> e4, wow. So, I can take, then there's this, then I have to move my bishop. Um, my pawn is still out here. I can move my bishop somewhere, like there. I can push. I can go bishop g5 again. I don't know what to do. Crazy. I can danger level, right? Pawn, this. Um, bishop g5, if takes, then it's a fork. Let's say... Hmm. The best move is actually bishop g5. Uh, I, I, I think. If takes, takes. Bishop comes here to attack this pawn. But then I'm hanging here. I don't know. Let's do it. The best move, I think, is bishop g5 because it act it's the most forceful move I have. Bishop g5 must be dealt with because when I take the knight, it's a fork. Whereas pawn takes e4 is a little bit less forcing. I mean, the opponent can actually... Right, yeah, they can still do that. Um, I have to make sure all of this is protected. Uh, I'm going to go bishop c4. So this little pawn movement from d5 to e4 gave me that target. However, g4 is just left to die uh, because the move e4 undermined my, my, my defense of g4. So this is a game that can really go either way, uh, especially at the 1400 level, if you don't see bishop g5. If you miss bishop g5, that's... Sorry. That's chess. That's chess. Knight takes g4. Knight takes g4. And um, this is under attack, but so is f7, right? So is f7. Uh, now, here it's very hard to see that there's a move which the knight will go to f2 and attack the rook. And that could be very tragic. That could be a very tragic way to lose because we're going to lose some material if that happens. Um... Mm, man, I don't know what to play. Let's play bishop g5. So we're attacking the rook. If the rook takes us, we take back. And then we're still threatening to take on f7. It is very easy here to blunder bishop takes f7 and knight to f2. Right? Because we, we just miss that. The idea is not to take our pawn, but the idea is to go for max danger. That's what I'm trying to teach you all. Look how they can attack you. That is a good move. f6 is a... Uh, is a is a good good move. Um, hmm. Okay, maybe just bishop back to h4. Okay, this can still be taken. Knight e3 is a fork, but not quite because we can take the rook and we can also give a check. So you can get out of attacks like this, right? So I think this is my opponent's idea. Yes. Now, how do you deal with this? Rook d4, you get taken. Bishop back, that's the last resort. You, It's better to lose a knight for a rook than lose a bishop for free. So if we just go rook somewhere and lose this, that's not good. But losing at least this is better. But we have check. That's the most important thing. Danger levels. Now we have danger levels again. We can move the rook, but we can also take. I'm going to take. There's a rook hanging here. But now my opponent's going to be like, wait a minute, but I have rook f8. And now there's a bishop hanging, and this is hanging. Craziness. But there, we can attack the rook again. It's crazy. It's an insane position, right? Completely insane position. 
Um, Rook F8 is a, is the best move here probably. And 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 now as we we get to the end game, both sides have passed pawns. There's an F pawn and an E pawn. Both sides. My pawn is probably more vicious. It's supported by two bishops. This king is quite far and cut off. And my opponent has... Oh, no, they reconnected. Um, knight takes d1, bishop takes h8, and now... f6, f7, f8 is a massive threat. So is e3, e2, e1. In fact, my opponent is faster. But e3, f6, e2, f7, e1, we queen with check. So there's f6, e2, right? f7... F7? But you know what the craziest part is? There's check. There's check. And if I take, there's queen with check. Oh no! But I'm a little bit lucky here because number one, I can take with the bishop. And I cover promotion. You always have to look at checks. I can take with the bishop, cover promotion. Yes, so right now I can just play this and the game is over. But you also have king c2. If you really need it, you can queen. You can avoid the queening with the check with king c2. But then there's other checks with the knight. And it can be a little bit insane. This is the easiest. And it's a little lucky. A little bit lucky it was there. But now, by the way, um, at the 1400 level, you can come back and win the pawn. But we actually just have a mate. Queen c8 is just, you know, you, you should follow the money. You should follow the money. Um, and it's made, but I mean, that was, that, that was a great game. And as we saw from actually the rerun of this game, that if you know your openings and you know the ideas of your openings, and in the Vienna in particular, you have Bishop C4 with this buildup, or you have, you know, various Queen G4s, for example, the Vienna. In the Vienna, you have the copycat. And by the way, this is brand new to you. You've never heard of the Vienna or the copycat variation. You are missing out on some stuff. Um, but, uh... The Vienna is, is crazy, and again, bishop b4 is, is, a, is a move, and I mean, it's, it's not a very popular move at all. So when you're, when you're met with things you don't know in the opening, you still have to kind of play uh, similar to the plans that you know from your opening, but obviously not identical. Yeah, the rest of this game was very, very balanced. I'm, I mean, I'm constantly hunting at, at threats on my opponent, transferring to attack weak squares and making decisions that transform the position and potentially leave me with certain weaknesses right and the opponent immediately responding to that and me defending and then we had a bunch of pawn jostling here first of all obviously i missed um bishop g5 missed but you always have to be on the lookout for small positional changes and um yeah the best move here is bishop g5 but the position's equal position's equal here um actually after bishop c4 knight e5 which attacks this and defends this look at that and black is winning Knight to e5 attacks my bishop, and, and, and if black had found that move, and I would have just lost my pawn with no counterplay, I'm just lost. I mean, I'm just down a clean pawn, and black is playing knight f2, knight d3, so there are chances in your games, folks. These chances absolutely do exist. Uh, let's move along to game number three. Here, we're going slightly down from four... Wait, what is this? Wait, my opponent told me that... Oh, my opponent is 1330 in rapid. What? Well, they snuck into this episode, so E4, let's play a Karo Khan. Because the, the motto here uh, is to play some openings that we are familiar with. Sorry, I'm writing about being disappointed. Oh, this is a crazy episode. Karo Khan, <laughs> trying to play in the center with c6 and d5. Um, that's funny. Okay, we have a little bit of an imposter here. The series says 1,000 to 1,400, and they are, if we take their other rating. That's hilarious. Man. I mean, how are, the, how are we expecting to get really good at chess if we can't even follow simple instructions you know before all these recordings i i uh i say hey i'm looking for volunteers who are rated a thousand to fourteen hundred in um in blitz well, my opponent gave me the rapid rating okay karo Khan defense against e4 uh, is trying to meet that center pawn 
and support it with the center pawn. The opponent trades and plays bishop to d3. So now the general rule of thumb here is to play knight c6, knight f6. Um, to me, the Karo Khan is one of the greatest openings to learn as an aspiring intermediate player. By the way, this pawn structure, if you remember from a game ago, folks, I don't know if you, uh, how much attention you've all been paying. You recognize this pawn structure from two games ago? Well, look at this game. You see how it's similar? That's because the London can actually become a Karo Khan with the right pawn trade. There's just no bishop on f4. I am not going to be playing f6. This time I'm going to go back to this. And if the bishop does come out, I'm going to play queen b6 as we saw in, um, in that game. So let's see what happens. I want to develop my bishop. I want to develop my pawn. I want to develop my other bishop. And again, the point of today was to um, play certain openings uh, and actually begin the game with some knowledge of what to do, not just following basic principles. And that's, that's what you have to do as you get better. So we're going to play bishop g4, finish our development, and go like this. You actually have to have certain things prepared. Uh, nobody freestyles. In the, even in the early four digits. Uh, I, I mean, obviously, there's, the chess world is big now, so there's many people who don't study openings and just do what they want. But um, I would recommend having some idea of what to do. Okay, bishop g5. That's the whole point of playing c-pawn, knight out, is to play queen b6. Uh, move ago, that didn't make much sense because there was a bishop defending the b-pawn. And yes, we could have finished our development with e-pawn e, e, e and out, but I'm trying to show you why you would play with the queen. Now, okay, b3 is a reasonable move. I don't hate it. Just simple, simple. e6. Bishop takes f6 here is not a crazy move, by the way, because if pawn takes, I will have an open king if I castle short. All right, so I can play bishop e7 to avoid that, or I can, I can just play bishop d6. I'm just going to play bishop d6. Because that's what Gotham told me to do. This pin is still alive and well. We're still very strongly pinning there, right? The only reason we're not taking it is... Aha! So my opponent did this, right? Am I going to do the same thing? No, no, no. I'm going to slide back. Now, this is terrible. Because this is a tripled isolated pawn. That would be a horrible pawn structure decision. Trading here would be better. And because my opponent did this before I castled short... Oh, this is going to be very bad news for my opponent because I'm going to castle long. You see, you broke my king's, my king's uh, structure. But I don't actually have to castle that way. I can castle long, right? Because why would I castle into that? Boom! But this still comes with certain risks. Certain risks meaning a4, b4, a5. I might still get attacked. Like right now, what my opponent should do and go, Oh, yeah, see, this is too slow. I don't know what that does. My opponent has to go b4, a4 immediately, because I'm not going to mess around. I'm going to play rook here, which, by the way, hangs a pawn. But that pawn is so meaningless. Why? Because I want those lines open. I mean, you win a pawn, but you open up my entire h-file by winning that pawn, right? So it's, it's really dangerous to take that pawn. White needs to play b4, a4, a5. Like, white needs to go for it now. But they like a pawn, so I'm going to go up. I could bring my other rook. See, this is what, I, this is what you try to... When, when, you, when you castle on opposite sides, I mean, imagine a position my opponent didn't have an A-pawn. You think that matters? They have an open rook now. All right, so now you've given me... I can go to H8, but this, this looks pretty natural as well to just attack this. I mean, you've just given me a, a, a bullseye, right? This is, this is... You didn't wait for me to castle to open up my king. That sh what, that's what you should have done. But because you allowed my king to go to the complete opposite side and you're not even attacking me, you're letting my king survive. Oh, now there might be some sacrifices. So folks, what I like to say is the rule of plus two. If you have two more attacking pieces than they have defenders, there is a very good chance you should sacrifice. Um, so right now, I think bishop takes g3. I mean, I have the rook barricade down here. Even if you don't see it down to its conclusion, you have massive, massive, massive capability to attack here with your rooks. Um... If king, well, I can just take this. I mean, that's almost mate. And I can take this as well, but, but isn't just, I mean, I mean, it's almost a ladder mate here. Oh my God, it's almost a ladder mate. <laughs> this is crazy. Knight has to come back to h2. Now, at this point, what do you do? 
This is this is like how games are won and lost right here. You sacked a full bishop, but you got some pawns. You have a big attack. What now? Bishop f3 takes. Ooh, you've got some pieces not attacking, right? So at this point, I think there's a winning combination. I think rook h2 right away. Check, most forcing option. And then come back with check. So none of these pieces get to move. Understand, check, check, and then bring the queen. But I'm going to do this because I see this. That's too slow. Because I think there's knight f3 now. And I think maybe white can begin consolidating. So I've made a mistake. Rook takes h2, right? Rook takes h2 is the most forcing option. But queen c7 is the more, more uh, 1100, 1200, whatever you want to estimate my opponent's strength as. That's queen c7 is much more obvious, obvious, right? Because then you bring your queen as well. Okay, rook f2. So if I take, take, that's nothing, right? So maybe queen g3 I'm looking at now. Oh, yes, queen g3 is a very nice move because, because I'm threatening the rook and stuff here. And the hardest thing to see is this. I got a little lucky. Let's just say I never saw that, right? I just bring my queen down there just because that's what I wanted. I wanted to bring my queen and activate it. And now I have two more, three more attacking pieces, right, than guards. I can hardly call this a guard, but... So now I'm, I'm constantly, I'm looking, is there a mate, is there a mate? There actually is, there's a, there's a force mate. I'm actually threatening rook takes h2, rook takes, and bishop f3, which is just... A... No, 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 that's not mate. Oh my gosh, that's actually not a mate, and I will analyze that afterward. I thought that was a checkmate, but it's not. Boom, 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 it's not. Wow, because when the knight takes... The queen's vision opens up. <sighs> this is crazy. <laughs> oh, gosh. But hopefully this is at least instructive, you know? Don't rush opening up the king's position. Now, obviously, that's under attack. So I can go, go take that. But do I have anything better? No, I, I don't think so. I don't think I'm missing anything. A successful attack does not necessarily have to end in checkmate. It could end in the winning of material. And in this case, it will be ending in the winning of material. We're going to get in. We're going to win our piece back. All right? And then we're going to... We're going to try to... Do some damage beyond that. <clears throat> do this. Hmm. Ugh. Now, there is rook f6, but then d2 is falling, and my rook is here among the pawns. So if I can win c3, I'm going to probably win d4, and uh, we can, at, all, at any chance we get, we can continue to attack the king, but obviously the easiest thing to do would just be to take on c3 and just win some pawns. Um, knight b1, okay. How do we win this now? We can reroute our knight. That's, this, is, this is the high-level move, I think. Knight e7, knight f5, knight, knight in here, just like we did with the queen. But knight e7 is absolutely not... That's not normal. I would go bishop g6. I cannot deliver a check with my bishop, but I can deliver it on e4, where it probably just paralyzes white, like bishop e4, and the king is stuck in the corner. So that's my idea. I mean, you have a lot of ways to win. You can probably just get this pawn out of danger by playing f5. I think knight e7 and knight to f5 and knight to g3 is devastating. But if you have a 1400 opponent that does that, you can report them for cheating. So. Right, bishop g6 to try to go to e4. Opponent is going to get... Is there a really nasty way to lose here? To play king g2. King g2 is an incredible move by white. If white plays it, that would be so sick. This is a double check and a mate. <laughs> Bishop e4, double check and mate. I almost hope the game ends like that. Okay, it doesn't. I can take this now, but I'm going to finish my plan. And uh, now white is going to have to play knight to f3. And I've, again, I can, I can do this and this. But I think this is the easiest. You just add pressure to the knight, which is pinned. It's getting completely ganged up on and... I don't know if the opponent is going to, uh, I don't know if the opponent will resign, but 
I mean, you can definitely play a few more moves, even even at 1300 rapid or whatever this, this person is. Make them checkmate you. You never know. Right? You never know. Yeah, knight b5. Okay. Uh, I can take... Or I can take... Rook takes f3. I, I'm even going to take like this. Yes, you can take with the bishop, but uh, like I've been saying many times in this series, uh, you you should try to win end games if you can. You there's a lot less pieces on the board, and um, I probably should not have allowed knight d6. But okay, you can sometimes take your foot off the gas, right? You just go on autopilot. You're like ah, I mean I'm just gonna push my pawns. Yes, you can go definitely win as many pawns as possible. But really, when you are in an end game in a position like this, you can push. I think taking here is better, but I'm gonna push because pass pawn must be good. And then when they try to blockade you, which is going to happen, what you need to do is you need to get some help. You need to either help with the knight. Many people, this is not the best move. Many people will quickly rush and try to just push the pawns, like to f4, for example. Oh, I don't want my bishop taken, so maybe I don't really care. But, but then you're going to get blockaded. And getting blockaded is really annoying because you can't, you can't move forward as easily, right? So what you can do here is just like, okay, mm, maybe bring my king. Still not the best. You should be trying to bring your knight, which you haven't moved since, like, move three. Try to bring your knight back and forward where it will be able to push through with f4. But, you know, you know, knight h3, okay. Uh, king f6, okay. We're just bringing our king. Ah, damn. Double attack. Okay, so let's come back. That's annoying. Getting this knight out of here. So we can go here and here. Or we can go here and here. I don't really see a difference, so I'm going to go back and this way. Still don't see a difference. Right? I don't know. It looks the same, so I need to get rid of the blockade, and then I'm going to be able to push through. Uh, yeah, let's go knight e7. There is a difference, by the way. When the knight is here, what's the difference? When the knight is on e6, you block this. So it's never too late to just begin blundering for no reason. There is a difference. That, that, that was the difference. King g5. Now we've won control of the first square. So with that, the, oh, okay, well, that's just a fork. So now not only do we get through, opponent is also going to lose a knight. And you can push, but again, you don't want the king to get close. So just hold on a second. You got the knight and the bishop extra. What are you rushing for? All right. Just make sure the king just can't block your pawn. You have, you have, you have that's it. The game is, is all yours. Just bring the pieces, control the squares in front of the pawn. Don't stalemate, but obviously in this case, there's a lot of... We, we can even leave the knight, by the way. I can even do this. Because, again, we, we won the battle for the squares in front of the knight. And now, just like always, the, the easiest thing to do, you can go hunting for checks. You can. Easiest thing to do, cut the king in a box. Just cut the king off. Just do this first, that's it. And now, now mate, mate the king as if, you know, you're, you're checkmating with, uh, you're checkmating with, with, with regular king and queen. But now you have the added benefit of the stalemate. See, if this was just this, it would be a stalemate. But because white has legal moves, you can, you can do the stalemate, you can get close, you can win the game. Um, this game was a, was a very solid Karo Khan. We played the Karo Khan defense against e4, right? We exchanged. And we played normal moves, we just developed. Now, what do we know about the Karakhan? We know, oh, we know, we know about this queen idea. Is it necessary? Would have been obviously a lot stupider with the bishop back here. We can still do it. But we did it, okay. Got thwarted, developed, and our opponent did this. And we obviously did that. We didn't castle into that, right? Now, uh, had we um, castled into that, something like this, and we would have tried to do the exact same thing in terms of attacking, we would have maybe slid the king over. We would have maybe avoided losing this pawn. Something like king h8, rook g8. That's another way to do it. But because our opponent took immediately, we went the other way. We got out of there. We didn't allow that to happen, and that's why we, uh, that's why we got the win. Uh, final game of the day. Final game of the day uh, is against 1220 uh, from South Korea. I've played e4, so let's play, uh, let's play d4, and let's... Um, Let's see. I don't want to play a London, actually. E6. Okay. Let's play, uh, let's play C4. We're going to play uh, just Queen's Pawn, D and C, Knight's out. Okay, E6, B6. Very normal setup. Um, 
Let's just play knight f3. Knight c3. Something like this. And my opponent is playing a setup I really, really like. Actually, it's one of my courses with black. Yeah, you pin this. Uh, and again, I, I want to develop this bishop before I block it in. All right, so I want to develop the bishop before I block it in. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put it on f4. And then I'm going to play e3. I'm just going to play like basic, basic principles. Um, if you've never seen an opening or a defense for the first time, you're seeing it for the first time, rather, uh, you're not going to refute it. I mean, for example, when this bishop is here, we can, we can always ask what it wants. So we can, you know, what is our opponent trying to accomplish here with this bishop? The point of this opening, this is definitely not the point of the opening. No, 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 no. Um, this is not good. This is uh, an example of an individual who has purchased one of my courses and has not studied them correctly. <laughs> the point of the setup with black is to pressure the knight, which fights for the center. So black should be playing f5 and knight behind the pawn to support the e4 square. So every opening has its own set of ideas, right? Um, so e3 is now what I'm just gonna, I'm, I, by the way, that might be hanging, but that is such an absurd, like, move that almost never exists that it's completely natural to overlook it. But the problem with this move is it's very short-sighted. When you develop your queen like this, particularly when your position is lacking space, as my opponent says, uh, very high chance you just struggle to develop. Let's say I, I'm, I'm not even gonna develop this, I'm just gonna be like, why is your bishop here, right? Takes, takes. Okay, but now what? Because your queen is in front of everybody, the knights and, every, and the pawns, it, it, it's, it's, it's not so clear how you're going to develop once you've kind of run out of moves. I mean, my, my development is a lot more natural. I have a little bit more center space. I have a good bishop. And um, my opponent actually plays a move which can lead to, uh, can lead to some really funny stuff here. The queen is trapped. Trapped. Will my opponent see the response? Bishop takes f3. Incredible move. Incredible move. Bishop takes f3. Danger levels. And if I take with the pawn, I lose this. If I take the queen, I lose my queen. If I take this, and then rook g8. Bishop takes f3. So I'm gonna have to take back with my queen. Yes, they see it. Amazing. Good thing they didn't tilt, resign, nothing. Excellent stuff. So I take with my queen. If takes, takes. All right, I can't get the rook. Do not forget, you just abandoned the diagonal. So there is a rook in the corner. Of oh, oh, no. Oh, no, no. And this is very bad because I have this. But of course, short castles here. Okay. Right? Right? Now. Folks, I'm going to be completely honest with you. While your queen can continue gobbling, um, you have to be very careful. Because if your queen takes, this queen can take this. This queen cannot take this pawn right now. Right? It's not possible. So, queen f3. Which actually kind of looks like a blunder. I would recommend more, like 9 times out of 10, if you just did that, and you want to gobble, make sure they can't take you. And if they can, just come back. Do yourself a favor, as long as nothing is hanging, come back. Why? You might lose the queen. I'm going to be totally honest with you. You might lose the queen. If, like, you might get it trapped with a pawn, the door shuts, queen's dead. Okay? Um, knight h4 here is, is a max danger move by my opponent. Knight h4. Who's, my opponent is still struggling with the fact that because they developed their queen so early, they don't have a lot of space and they just sort of have some random pieces standing around, right? Knight h4 was pretty good. It was a decent move. And now I'm going to castle. So I, I am castled. I have a little bit more space. Uh, we still have an extremely close position. So we have um, eight pawns each. Right, knight h4. So we have to be careful if we move the queen. It's a mate. So I'm going to slide the queen over a square. Try to trade queens. Of course, queen trade is nice for me. I, I am up a rook for a knight. And what we want to accomplish in a position that is closed is take as much space as possible where we can. Uh, and pawn breaks. We need to rely on a pawn smash somewhere to open up the position. So, queen g3 is a good move. Putting some pressure over here. And I'm thinking a4, a5. Now, this is not great. It's generally better to take toward the middle, by the way. You can do this and it opens your rook, but you weaken e3. 
I would take toward the center. Even this, like, this is opening, but this is almost impossible to take advantage of. Um, now, if you would like to make this trade and your, your logic is kind of like, well, you know, I have two rooks and the more I trade, the better. You can. It's not the best move. But if you want to be really stubborn, like, I'm going to simplify the position no matter what. Yeah, by the way, see? My opponent does give themselves that F takes. Better to play H takes. Okay. A4. We want a pawn. We want a pawn breaking. Okay, doesn't work. C5, not quite there. Uh, take some space wherever you can, right? So uh, D5 is fine, but again, we want to not allow our opponent access to squares. If we play D5, opponent's knight will live on C5 forever. Right now, the knight can't come up, so I'm going to play E4. If the opponent plays E5, hoping I push or take, I'm just going to leave it. You see? Because they want me to take, but I have reinforcements. F4, I told you, close position, take some space. Take some space where you can, where you're not going to be surrendering uh, anything to the opponent. Take some space. Now, some serious tension here. Obviously, if pawn takes, I might try to offer a rook trade. I might undouble my pawn. I don't know. But yeah, close positions can be annoying. They can kind of show you it's, it's quite difficult. Now, knight f6 attacks this, but continuity, it forgets about the e5 pawn. So while this move is very natural, this one, to protect this pawn, now we should probably take because we are guaranteed a trade of rooks, which is obviously good for us because that leaves us rook versus knight. And let me tell you, rook versus knight is probably not a good situation. Okay, rook trade. This knight is attacking this, but first I'm going to throw in this pawn capture. The more I trade, the better. Now you want to get to a point where you stop. Okay, you don't want to trade everything. Okay. Knight takes. This is hanging. Push it. That's not complicated, right? Just push it, obviously. Push it. Pawn break. Trade some pawns, right? We want to leave about three or four pawns on the board. Pawn takes, pawn takes. And by the way, this move is a fork. Yes, very good. Very well done. So, uh, now the best move is the is rook f1 check. With the point being that, and that, that's why you always have to look for checks. The point being that if the king moves to the e-file... We actually pin the knight to the king. That's way too mean. So rook f1 would either force the knight back or the king to get passive. Uh, I feel like no human being sees this move. It was like 1200, so instead I'm going to push my pawn. Why am I pushing that pawn? That, that, that pawn is the most advanced. So if I push the c pawn here, this just comes back. But this pawn has hopes and dreams of becoming a queen. So what I want to do is maybe bring my rook and win these pawns, right? So, folks, do not hang a rook. That is so brutal. Don't hang a rook like this. Please. For your own good. Rook e1 is not a terrible move, but I have no future prospects over there. Uh, so I'm going to play rook a3. Rook a3 is another way of bringing my rook to the party with tempo. We've talked about this in this video. Uh, tempo, right? We want to attack the knight. The problem with attacking this knight, like this is an inexcusable blunder, and it happens all the time. The rook attacks the knight, the knight attacks the king and the rook. It happens so much. Because you just forget. You're just like, ah, right? You just forget. So which pawn should I go for? I guess I can play rook d3 and rook d7. I can play rook b3 and rook b7 as well. Um, I don't know. I mean, they both look fine, right? So let's go here. Let's go here. Right, knight b4 may be annoying. Rook d7. By the way, winning move here, check. Check, king up, check again. I call that the boomerang technique. That way you don't lose this pawn. If you check, check and do this, right? You're gonna win that pawn. But I, 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 I just see this, that was my idea. But rook d8, rook d7 is the best idea. And these things exist. This is the difference between the 12 and a 1500. Rook d8, rook d7. Bait the king forward, check it again. We saw that, by the way, with rook f1. Rook f1 to bait the king to the e-file. But I'm 1200. I don't see that. I don't see that. Instead, what I see is I'm going to go here and I'm, I'm going to try to win this a-pawn. I'm going to try to use my rook. And this is a great example of just rook is going to beat a knight like this in an isolated situation, all right? Like a rook is just going to beat a knight. So now I'm going to play... Um, Rook a7, or, or rook c5. Rook c5 is even cleaner, right? Rook c5. If rook a7, the knight just comes back. So now rook c5 is a fork, and I'm going to win the a-pawn. If I'm going to win the a-pawn, I'm going to have an a-pawn there, which is why uh, you need to leave a few pawns on the board. 
uh, when you want to win like a rook versus knight endgame, this is the easiest way to do it. Because the king is the king, the knight and the king are just are just way too slow. And once the king starts piping up and trying to take it, you know, you start doing stuff like this. And the king unfortunately just has to stay and protect the pawns. Okay, well, my opponent doesn't uh, doesn't think so. So now we're gonna, as the king runs to stop our pawn, we're gonna gobble the rest of the pawns. And there's no way king and knight can stop AG. That's just the pawns are way too far apart. I mean, they can't stop A and B together, too. But right, so. Hopefully this was instructive, right? Hopefully this was instructive. Um, don't lose this pawn if you don't need to. No need to lose the pawn. So just push it. Folks, I want to uh, draw your attention to um, a couple of things that we obviously talked about in today's episode as we wrap up. Uh, the Karo Khan course, which is one of my opening courses. Uh, absolutely incredible. In fact, I play many of those lines myself, even against titled players. Uh, they're... Awesome, awesome lines. E6, B6, which we saw in this game. But uh, the warning that I have for you in this game, I'm going to actually go rook E6. And if the opponent blocks my pawn, I'm going to fork. The warning I have for you is if you get a course, actually study it. And, and, and don't, just, don't just get it to feel good, but not actually study it. Okay, let's bring this rook back and push. We're going to bring the rook back, cutting off the king in the night, and we are going to push the pawn. Uh, E4 course, Vienna, one of my favorites. Absolutely love the Vienna. I adore it. It is so great um, for so many different levels of chess. Probably about 2,400 and below. You're going to be melting people with how, with how good the Vienna is. And now this is the conclusion. We go after the knight to try to remove it from that promotion square. And by the way, here after... Okay, well, I was if there if we had a fork, but I'm going to queen. And the opponent will probably play this out. Probably? I don't know. Obviously, okay. So, what's going to be annoying about this is that when we check, the king is going to get to stand in front of the... Okay. So I was going to say, like, if the king comes to f6, we have to somehow, like, it, we have to move the rook out of the way, but then we would just obviously march up and make the queen and not stalemate. So, uh, yeah, some of my opening courses obviously were played today, some not, but... Uh, here, you have to play for f5. The whole point of this setup with black is you have to develop in a way that makes sense, in a cohesive way. So the bishop pins the knight, so the knight cannot support the center. The bishop and the pawn support the center, so does the knight, black castles. But not, not like this. I mean, the, the danger with bringing the queen out is that you, you just fall behind in development and accidentally trap your own queen. It's so lucky that this, this existed, right? So lucky. Like, imagine this was the position, and then you, this, you just lose. You just lose the game because your queen's out there. What the hell's your queen doing out there? In a position where you have no pawn space, your queen should not be among the pieces. The queen should be back here, waiting, just like mine. My queen's not out battling stuff, right? Um, and then small tactical oversight, and then hopefully you learned how to handle a close position, right? Trading, simplifying down in an endgame. So uh, try to keep this episode... About 50 minutes, unfortunately, it was an hour long. Uh, but I hope you enjoyed it very much. And I will see you back for episode number four.